Hello, and welcome back to Brain and Behavior. We're going to be talking about the visual system today. We'll uh, talk a little bit about the uh, stimulus characteristics uh, that the visual system is processing. We will also um, talk about some of the structures that are important for transducing the visual system or those visual stimuli into the neural code. We'll also talk about some of the neural anatomy of how it gets back and processed along uh, the different pathways in the visual system. And then we'll talk about function, how we process, how the neurons process that information and changes as we go through those structures. And then we'll finish talking about a little bit of pathology. The pathology actually reinforces some of the functional changes we see occurring as we move through the visual system. Again, this is uh, chapter nine, uh, the visual system. And let's go ahead and get started. So the stimulus that activates or is being processed by the visual system comes from the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum has a large range of stimuli within it. We, however, only process a small portion of that range. Now, we see that other animals are able to use parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we are not. For example, both butterflies and honeybees are able to process information from this ultraviolet portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. We see that we can also use x-rays to visualize uh, um, certain substances. And uh, outside here, we see gamma rays. So uh, beyond this end, infrared, those that wavelengths or those wavelengths are within the range in which we can use or for night vision devices such as cameras and goggles. And as we move further along, the wavelengths getting progressively longer. We see microwaves and then radio waves that's used to carry information between devices. Um, within the range that we can see, 400 nanometers would be around the blue is what we consider blue. So if you're looking at something blue that's in your environment right now, that's uh, emitting these wavelengths of 400 nanometers in length. And then we get it right around uh, green is going to be close to 500, yellow is going to be close to 600, and then red is going to be all the way over here at 700 uh, nanometers um, in length. So that's the wavelength. And what we'll see is that there are several other characteristics of stimuli that come from this uh, um, this modality, the visual system. Um, first, like we said, the wavelength will determine the exact color that you're looking at. But we see that there's also a certain amount of uh, purity associated with the wavelength that's being given off. So you can imagine that as you uh, have more wavelengths coming together or overlapping uh, or being produced at the same time, what's going to happen is you're going to have less purity and less saturation. So in our picture here, we see this is very low levels of saturation uh, where there's multiple wavelengths that are coming in to influence that. Whereas we move progressively further uh, right here, we see we have higher purity of the wavelength. And we're just exclusively looking at that one hue or that one wavelength, and we'll obviously have higher saturation. In addition, we can change the amplitude or the peaks and troughs of those waves. When we do that, we can increase the brightness. So what we see here is the change in the brightness of that stimulus that's there. So by increasing the amplitude of the wave, we're going to, wave, we're going to increase the amplitude brightness or the wave uh, um, amplitude of the stimulus we're looking at. So given that these are all reflected off the stimuli uh, or uh, objects in our environment, how does the visual system process this? What are the structures that are important? And obviously an area that uh, plays important role in this is the eye. And you might remember back to Jim class or health class talking about the structure of the eye and, and uh, some of those critical features. We'll just briefly review them here. Remember the cornea is that uh, transparent uh, uh, layer of tissue that an image has to pass through. Um, this is where you'll attach your contact lens uh, that will then change the focus uh, 
range here of uh, the image coming through the eye. After the um, the cornea, it has to pass through the uh, aqueous humor. That is that uh, fluid that separates the um, cornea from the iris, which is a band of circular muscles that can contract or relax to change the size of the pupil. The pupil here is that opening that controls how much light is let in. So if you're in a theater watching a movie and your pupils are going to dilate, they're going to get much larger. And when you walk out of the theater and it's in the middle of the day, you just saw a matinee, if you will, you walk out and the lights are really bright, your iris is going to uh, change shape so that your pupil will be much smaller to let in less light uh, to try to protect the eye. So controlling the amount of light that gets in um, is the iris does it by changing the size of the pupil. Now, after the light makes it through the pupil, it will then hit a lens. And what the lens does is it will change shape to focus different depths of field. Uh, so if you're focusing something that's close, like you're reading, and then you decide to look up and see what's going on across the room on the TV, uh, you'll have to change the shape of the lens to accommodate for those different distances. And so that ability to change the shape of the lens changes over time. And as you age, the lens tends to be less flexible. So when you're younger, the lens is very flexible and malleable, and we can change our depth of field that we're focusing. As you get older, it becomes less flexible. And so we can't distort the shape of it to accommodate different things. And then you need to uh, maybe have bi bifocals uh, to help with that under those circumstances when you're reading close versus you're focusing far away. Now, after it makes... Um, it through the lens, it's going to then get back to the back of the eye, the retina. And the retina is where all of our uh, uh, neural uh, structures are that are going to be critical for transducing or taking that stimulus from the electromagnetic spectrum and turning it into that neural code, action potentials and synapsing, releasing of those uh, uh, neurotransmitters. Um, so at the back of the eye, we have two important areas that I want to talk about briefly. One is the fovea. The fovea is where we tend to focus our, uh, our visual information on. That doesn't mean we can't see in other areas of the back of the eye. This is just an area where there is a high amount of uh, um, photoreceptors, and this is where our lens tends to focus those images that we're really kind of consider, uh, kind of uh, focusing our attention on or directing our attention to. And so the fovea is that focal range. I have to talk about the fovea, and we'll, we'll come back to this, as the HD TV center of the eye. It's where we have the highest visual resolution. Now, just uh, on the other side of the fovea, what we have is the blind spot. And the blind spot is where all of the axons and blood vessels will exit or leave the eye. It's that kind of uh, part of the entertainment center where all the cables are leaving. And because of that, there are no photoreceptors located at the blind spot. So that's a part of our visual field. Although we're looking, you're looking, you're watching this, and it doesn't seem like your visual system looks like Swiss cheese, and that you got this big hole there. You can actually test for this by looking at an image and gradually moving it away, and this will fall into the blind spot, and you won't be able to see it. Uh, so the blind spot is an area of our visual field where we're not able to see information. And the surrounding tissue kind of fills it in. So as we move through the visual system, there's a lot of redundancy. And what happens is all these adjacent photoreceptors fill that in with what's going on around it. And it's able to make a coherent whole. Even though if there's a stimulus just specifically in the blind spot, we can't see it when it's positioned there. Um, so uh, those two are important features of the retina. What we want to do then is talk a little bit more about um, the retina and those photoreceptors or those sensory neurons that transduce 
take that energy, uh, that stimulus from the electromagnetic spectrum and translate it into action potentials, that first uh, kind of code uh, that the central nervous system, the language that the central, surface, central nervous system uses to communicate. So here we're at the back of the retina. This is the very back of the retina. And one of the things you'll notice, which I found just kind of very interesting when I first learned about this, is that in fact light has to go through multiple layers of cells before it actually gets to the photoreceptors. Then it has to bounce off the back of the eye and then it finally gets transduced or turned into that neural signal here. So uh, it has to go through, light will have to pass through a layer of ganglion cells, a layer of bipolar cells, and it has to actually make it all the way through the photoreceptors before the photoreceptors will turn it into action potentials that then will release neurotransmitters on the bipolar cells. Those bipolar cells will then generate action potentials that then will release neurotransmitter on these ganglion cells. And then these ganglion cells have axons that will leave the retina and go into the central nervous system. So the flow of information is light has to pass through the ganglion cells, it has to pass through the um, bipolar cells, and then gets to the back of the eye, reflects back, and then is gathered or transduced at the photoreceptors, and then they send connections to bipolar cells. Bipolar cells send connections to ganglion cells, and then the ganglion cells collect that information and send it into the central nervous system. And what do you think the first synapse may be in the central nervous system prior to getting to the cortex? The thalamus, you're right, the thalamus, that relay center of the brain, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But before we do, I'd like to talk about two different types of photoreceptors that we see here, and I have a graph next that also illustrates this, um, that there's an uneven distribution of these two different types of photoreceptors. The cones, which collect information about color, are found in a high concentration in the fovea. So you see almost exclusively the cones are found within the fovea. Remember the fovea is where the lens is going to focus that energy uh, from the environment. Uh, so that really uh, uh, important uh, um, high uh, um, concentration of visual information is going to be coming into the fovea. That's what the lens is focusing there. Whereas as we move away from the fovea, we start to see rods. And rods process information about contrast. So kind of lines, darks, uh, those kinds of things. It's all about contrast. So they don't process anything about color. They process information about level of light. Uh, so under dark conditions, uh, where it's twilight or it's, uh, you know, over in the middle of the night, our um, cones aren't going to be very effective because there just isn't that light level there to support them. That's where our rods come in and they really provide an important amount of information about contrast. So if you're walking through your house and the lights are off and you can see, for example, the doorway moving or you see the dresser moving as you're walking through your bedroom at night, you get that sense of movement. That's those cones and you can't really tell under dark what color things are. You can just get kind of outlines of them and that's that kind of combination um, of um, under light conditions you can see good color information that's those cones. Under dark conditions you can get good contrast information about movement and that's arising from the rods. And we see already at the retina these two different types of aspects of our visual world are separated out and this will continue as we go through these additional parts of our visual world. Now just a further kind of reinforcement of the distribution of rods and cones across the retina. I like this graph because it does a really nice job of showing you uh, the retina from the temporal portion to the nasal portion. So from the side of the head more lateral to the nasal portion which is more medial. Uh, what we see is there's a change in the distribution of rods and cones. Here we see towards the more lateral, there's not much in the way of rods and cones, but as we move more medial, rods increase in their density much more so. And then we see cones uh, don't really show much in the way of 
much in the, in the uh, presence here in the periphery until we get right here at the fovea. And we see that there's a high concentration and there's a very low concentration of uh, rods. And then that uh, changes as we start to then move uh, away a little bit closer to the nasal portion here. And then here's the optic disc showing that, <clears throat> that part of the eye here um, uh, where that optic nerve is leaving the vasculature is coming in and out there. Uh, so there are no photoreceptors located at that area. And then as we get further and further and closer to the nose, we see there's a uh, drop down in rods and we see the drop down in cones as well. So this is just going from the temporal portion all the way through the nasal portion. And remember the back of the eye is, um, the back of the eye is uh, shaped more like a, a cup or uh, as this curved aspect of it. And we'll come back to that when we're talking about the pathways. Another thing I just want to really reinforce for you is the fact that uh, light has to pass through these, these ganglion cells and then it has to pass through the bipolar cells. It bounces off the back of the retina and then here at the photoreceptors, the uh, cones and rods, it uh, is transduced into the neural code. There it then synapses on the bipolar cells, synapses on the ganglion cells, and then sends those outputs out to uh, the rest of the visual system. So there's that sequence of uh, processing information where it has to pass, the light has to pass these layers before it's even turned into an action potential, and then those synapses support that information. So we can talk about, after it's made it through these different uh, um, ganglions into the visual system, we have three different pathways that uh, we can talk about. And we'll spend only a little bit of time talking about our first two. The last one, the geniculostriate, will be the basis of the rest of our discussion for the class. So the retinohypothalamic is a, a pathway that's involved in processing a very small segment of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's basically kind of in the blue range from 460 uh, to 480 nanometers of wavelength. We see that it's a very small segment. And there are those segments of the retina from those ganglion cells that go directly to the hypothalamic uh, nucleus component and specifically the suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is a structure that is associated with the hypothalam hypothalamus. Um, uh, and if you recall, that structure was involved um, in terms of um, many different regulatory functions. Um, and one of the, the roles that the uh, retinohypothalamic um, pathway plays a role in is the sleep-wake cycle. And we'll come back to this later on. Um, that will be our last chapter we talk about sleep, that uh, this pathway is important for regulating or being tuned to our environment, using those environmental cues to regulate when we go to sleep and when we wake up. Um, so this part of the pathway is really important for regulating that we tend to go to sleep at the same time and tend to wake up at the same time. Um, so this pathway is important for that. And what's nice is, and we'll talk about this, is that this pathway can be used to eliminate certain sleep problems or issues related to waking and sleeping. So this is the pathway that's going to be important for that. The next um, pathway, oh, and another thing, just a little fun experiment for you to try to sh also show you another function though right now hypothalamic pathway is the fact that it's involved in the pupillary reflex um, which uh, helps to gather visual information uh, as light conditions go down. So really what you can do is take your phone, your smartphone, and um, record, uh, take a little video of one eye so what you can do is have both of your eyes open and then take a video of one eye as it stays open and close the other eye. So right now I am going to videotape my left eye and I'm going to close my right eye. 
And after you've done that a couple of times, watch the video. And what you'll notice is the left eye's iris will open and close as the right eye is opening and closing. So if you close the right eye, the left iris will open up. And that's also another component or another feature of the retina hypothalamic pathway. It uh, engages this pupillary reflex. Now, the tepco pulvinar system um, collects information exclusively uh, from rods. And it then um, conveys that back to the thalamus and the pulvinar uh, portion of the thalamus. That's why it's called tecto pulvinar there. Um, and this information is really about movement of objects or contrast in the environment. And what this will do is as you move your head, so it's monitoring part of this pathway is collecting information about the head movement, but the other part is collecting information about where the eyes are in the visual field. So if you rotate your head across uh, a room, so you're kind of looking from one end of the room to the other end of the room, it looks like a camera, right? It looks like you're just scanning and it's a continuous shot panning across a field. However, the uh, actual uh, purpose of this pathway is if you were to videotape, and this is where you can take uh, a little video of your eye, now uh, take your smartphone and get a little video of your eye as, as you're rotating and looking across the room. Now watch that. What you'll see is that your eye will actually exhibit these little jumping movements. So as you're scanning across the room, what's happening is your head's moving, but then your eye is jumping to the next portion of the visual field, so it's a continuous flow of information. Uh, so again, stop this, uh, videotape your eye as you look from one part of the room to the other, and you'll notice your eye will make these little uh, jumps uh, as you go through and looking across the room. So you'll be able to see that. And that's the tecto system pathway that originates in the retina collecting information from those rods about contrast, those lines in the environment. And as they're moving, this will trigger the eye muscles to move the eye to the next logical or continuous portion of the visual field. So it feels as though as you're scanning across, you are able to uh, go to the next part, and it's a smooth transition. Now, the last pathway in the visual system is the geniculo stride. And this is the one that we typically think of in terms of our visual field. And we'll talk about processing three types of information. First, form, the shape of objects. Next, we'll talk about color, what color objects are. And then we'll talk about movement or how we detect movement. And this is all generated from the geniculo stride pathway. And it starts here at the eye. And remember, we talked about the eyes as being curved. So they have this curved component here. Uh, they're not flat detectors, but they're actually uh, uh, partially curved here in the back. Now, one thing you'll notice is that we have our visual field, what we see in our environment, and it's continuous to us. But our eyes are actually breaking this up into different components so that the portion of the retina that's closest to the nose, that nasal portion, is actually processing information about the periphery of the same side of space. So for example, this left nasal portion of the retina is processing information about the left peripheral field of view. This right uh, nasal portion of uh, the retina is processing information about this right peripheral field of view. That's in contrast to the temporal portion of the retina, as we can see here, that is on the right eye, but it's processing information from the central portion of the left visual field, so right here. So if we were to shine a little light right here, that would go back and that would actually get into the temporal portion of the right um, of the right retina, the temporal portion of the right retina. So just a little light here would go back, and it would be portrayed right there. So there is this kind of segmentation of our visual field. 
where the peripheral portions of our visual field here and here, these peripheral, are actually being processed by these nasal portions, whereas the central portion is being uh, processed by these temporal portions of those fields on the other side. Now what happens is everything in our, uh, for example, left visual field, this right area here, gets over to the, um, everything in the left visual field here gets over to the right hemisphere. And what happens is all that information from the uh, nasal portion here, as you can see here, will uh, cross over. So this nasal portion here crosses over. But everything here in the temporal portion remains ipsilateral or on the same side of the brain. So if you kind of follow this back, if it's coming from the temporal portion of the retina, it remains on the same side of the brain or ipsilateral and gets back to the uh, primary visual cortex or we'll talk about that striate cortex. But there has to be a synapse and that's it here in the genicular, uh, lateral genicular nucleus, which is a nucleus within the thalamus. Remember we talked about this as the thalamus is a relay center. Anything from the nasal portion of the retina, well that crosses over the midline, so that would be a decussation. Remember, we talked about that during the neuroanatomy, that we have decussations or fibers that cross over. And so this fiber is crossing over into the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus and having a synapse there, part of the thalamus, and then it sends its projections back to the occipital cortex or the primary visual cortex. So this is the genicular striate pathway. It's involved in processing information about form, about movement, and about processing color. Those three different aspects of our visual world that we tend to most commonly think about when I say visual system, you say, oh, I recognize objects. I can see that those objects have color and I can tell when an object is moving around in space. So those are the most typical things. Whereas we can see information from the retinal hypothalamic and tectopulmonar systems are also important just for other aspects of our uh, uh, visual world that we might not be as aware of. So let's talk a little bit more about that processing of information. What happens when we come back to the lateral geniculate nucleus? And we can see, remember already at the, um, at the retina there was a separation. We had more cones located in the fovea, whereas more rods were located in the periphery. What we see here is that separation continues, where information coming from the um, eyes, uh, everything, remember, from the nasal portion crosses over, and uh, thing from the temporal portion remains it's a lateral, it gets over. So everything from that left field of view gets over to the right hemisphere. It has its first synapse here and the lateral geniculate nucleus. The LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus, has layers. And what we can see is that information from the cones, um, that's color information that's in the fovea, is processed in layers three, four, five, and six. So layers three, four, five, and six of the LGN is processing color information. Whereas information from the rods that are located in the periphery, that contrast information, is only processed in layers one and two. So that illustrates, that really illustrates that um, there, that separation that we saw of rods and cones continues in this visual system. It continues uh, as we go through here. So that, that, that continues. So we refer to the cone processing system as the P-channel or the parvocellular pathway. Um, whereas information from the rods, uh, that contrast information, as the end channel. And this continues from uh, um, uh, that information, that, that separation that we saw in the retina to where we're looking at it from uh, here in the LGN or the lateral geniculate nucleus. Now as we move back from the LGN, we're going to get into the striate cortex. So this kind of fully fleshes out why do we call this the geniculus striate pathway because it kind of uh, 
has that one component, the lateral geniculate nucleus, and it terminates here in the striated cortex. Now, in the striated cortex, we see there's a real interesting mapping going on in terms of how the world, what we see, this is a picture of what you would see uh, in the world uh, out there where we have a, a visual uh, um, left half and right half. We also have a top portion of our visual field and bottom portion of our visual field. And in the center portion of our field, that's where information from the fovea is originating. And what we notice is when we get back to, and this is a, what kind of slice of the brain? It's a sagittal section that is on the midline. We can see the corpus callosum here. As we get back here to the occipital cortex and we focus in here, we see that uh, the image is flipped. So everything that was on the bottom portion of our visual field in the left visual field is now on the right and it's on the top. And everything that was on the top um, in left is now on the bottom right, we see down here. Another thing that you'll notice, oops, another thing that you'll notice here is that while the fovea, that area of high focus, is a relatively small area in terms of the entire visual field, it takes up a lot of real estate. It takes up more real estate in the occipital cortex than all the periphery. So this is just the periphery right here. So there's an uneven uh, kind of distribution of our visual field. So we have much more neural machinery set up to process this little square than what we have set up to process this entire area here. Just this little square gets all of this area here in the brain to proce we're processing that information. Whereas this entire area here only gets this small range. Uh, and, but it's far larger. So there's this uneven distribution of real estate in the brain to where the fovea gets a lot of real estate. That's where we have that, again, that HD high visual processing of information. So a couple things to take away from this mapping of the world into the striated cortex. Um, everything that's on the left gets to the right hemisphere. Everything that's in the top portion of the visual field is mapped upside down, down here. Everything that's in the bottom gets mapped up here. And the fovea gets a lot more real estate uh, um, than what you see all the periphery does. Now, from the striated cortex, we can also see there's divisions related to those P channels and M channels that we talked about. First, information uh, about <coughs> color and form uh, that's going to be coming from the cones primarily, but not exclusively, uh, will make its way to these blobs. So here we can see these tiny little uh, areas that are darker in concentration, and anatomists were very creative and that they named them blobs, exactly what they look like. And um, that processes information about color and form. So if you were to stick a little electrode into one of these blobs and turn it on, you would report seeing colors or shapes, um, that, uh, lines of certain uh, kinds of orientation. So it's processing information about color and form. Now, if you were to stick an electrode into the uh, inner blob region right here, what we see that it is most sensitive to, which is collecting most of its information from the rods, would be motion. So being able to detect movement. <clears throat> so that inner blob region is most sensitive to movement of inf information. And so we can kind of see a relationship between the M channel and P channel that we've talked about at the LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus, and how they're unevenly processing information from rods and cones, whereas cones are sitting, uh, getting a bulk of their processing in the blobs, where a bulk of the processing of um, rods is being done in the inner blob region. So cones are being mostly processed in the blobs whereas the rods are being processed mostly in the inner blob region. So where does the information go once it's been processed in this portion of the striated cortex? 
And what we see is that there are two principal pathways after this tunicular striate pathway that's important for our visual experience and using it to guide behavior. The first pathway is the dorsal stream, and it is going up to the parietal lobe, and it's car carrying information about movement. And there's two important areas that we can kind of talk about uh, that are using that visual information about movement to guide uh, um, action or behavior. The LIP, or the lateral interparietal area, LIP, lateral interparietal area, is involved in directing eyes to certain objects. Um, so, for example, um, when you see a picture of a face, you don't just passively look at it, but your eyes engage in these small kinds of movements to actively process where the nose, the mouth, and the eyes are on that image. That kind of movement, that kind of behavior depends on uh, this system, that actively processing system. So the lateral intraparietal area, or LIP, is a, a an area that receives information from this dorsal stream, uh, and it's located right here in this picture, the LIP. In addition to the LIP that receives information as part of this dorsal stream, we have the AIP, or the anterior intraparietal area, and that receives information from um, the dorsal stream, and it's important for the visual control of reaching. So as you're reaching for your cell phone, uh, you're going to have a certain kind of uh, movement where you're guiding it based on the visual system, and that is also looking at your hand as you're moving and reaching for that. So that visual information is updated to help you uh, reach for objects. Uh, so that those two structures are involved in those different aspects, the LIP in eye movements that are related to processing movement information and reaching movements. So you can see that the dorsal stream is really involved in motion, directing, coordinating, and organizing motion given the visual environment that we're in. In contrast, the ventral stream is in involved in recognition of color and form. So it's involved in color and form recognition. And two good examples of processing areas within this ventral stream is the FFA, or the fusiform face area, fusiform face area, which we can see here in red. Uh, the structure here is involved in processing faces. So if there's damage, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about pathology, damage to the fusiform face area will result in an inability to recognize faces, although you'll be able to recognize components of the face. So this is really important for recognizing faces. Another area in the ventral stream for recognizing objects is the PPA, or the perihippocampal place area. The PPA uh, is important for recognizing um, scenes. So if you uh, are looking through your pictures on your phone or other pictures that you have from childhood and you're able to say, oh, I remember that's when we went to that cottage. Oh, I remember that's our old house we used to live in. Or that's my room when I used to have uh, live in that uh, room before I moved to a different room. Uh, or that's my old dorm room. Those ability to recognize from a picture, or even when you're walking through an environment and you recognize where you're at in that environment, the visual characteristics of it are going to be processed by the PPA or the perihippocampal place area. And so the ventral stream is critically involved in recognizing objects, both the color and the shape of those objects. So we've kind of talked about the structure. Now what we want to do is give you a little bit of background or a little understanding of, okay, how do we build up these visual uh, information so that it can be processed, the ventral and dorsal streams? How do we build that up? 
And what we're going to do is talk about the cell firing characteristics of three different types of cells that are found in the LGN as well as in the striate or the, or the cortex. And we'll see that they have very different uh, kinds of characteristics and they start more basic and we build up from them. Um, now, I have included links in uh, Blackboard under the content section for each one of these YouTube videos because they don't play very well or aren't captured very well in the Blackboard Collaborate. But I will be playing them here because I think it's good for you to hear me describing what's in the video. So you can actually go file the link, pause now, and uh, or uh, wait for me to talk about some of the aspects of these firing characteristics and then have the video playing uh, in another window as I'm talking about it. So um, let's go ahead and, and talk about the function. Oh, briefly before we get to that, uh, just to bring these two things together, we do combine information processing within the dorsal and ventral stream. So we do actually use them together. Um, so as we're reaching for an object, we'll position our hands in different ways by recognizing that we're reaching for a cup versus recognizing that we're reaching for a pen. So the object recognition, what we're reaching for, <coughs> uh, plays an important role in the shape that our hand's going to take. So if you're reaching for a water bottle versus reaching for a pen, your hands will have different shapes and size um, organization as you're reaching for that object. Um, and as you're reaching, you have to guide where the hand's moving. So this is a job for both the dorsal and ventral stream. So now let's talk about function. And one of the um, uh, discoveries that were important in understanding how the visual system works was the discovery of on-center cells by Hubel and Weasel. Um, they were recording from the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus as they would play uh, or present certain visual stimuli. And what they discovered was that if the light was shown in a, on a wall, so it was a dark room, and then there was a wall in front of, uh, they used cats in these experiments. And if they put a light in a certain portion, they found that a cell would turn on or generate many quickly um, uh, burst, very quick burst of action potentials. And we would see that uh, it would generate many of them. However, if they put the light in, in an area outside of that, it actually kind of turned off or prevented action potentials from being fired very quickly. So here we see that action potentials are, are being fired very quickly. But what they noticed is that there's this surround kind of uh, field out in the world where it's if you shine light there, it turns off. And if you shine light in the center, the cell turns on. So they refer to these as on-center cells. Um, and what I'd like to do is show you a video. And again, you can link to this through Blackboard. And I have it open here. So this will show, or this will uh, show uh, the field that they had here, which was a piece of paper on a wall. And remember, the subject is watching this, and they're recording from these neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And um, the sounds that you hear are actually the generation of action potentials that they're listening. And so let's go ahead and play it. So you see they're moving this around. And those bursts are action potentials that are being presented. What makes this cell fire very quickly is if the light is just restricted to that central portion. You have that high burst. Now, if they restrict it just to the periphery, what you'll hear is they won't fire. But if it's here, like this, you can still hear firing. So if they focus it just on the periphery, it'll turn off. 
Now, as you saw in that video, if you watched the rest of it, they also discovered, in addition to on-center cells, off-center cells that have the opposite firing characteristics. So let's talk a little bit more of how, why does it have this center surround kind of organization? Why is that important? Why is that relevant? Well, what happens is that we actually see that there are many uh, center surround or on center cells and off center cells that have many overlapping fields. As you can see, the fields here overlap a great deal. And so if a light is shown or a line is shown, what's going to happen is that some cells are going to be turned off or other cells will be turned off, but there will be a cluster of cells that will be able to detect that line. And because you have a center surround organization, uh, you'll be able to detect them of any orientation. For example, look at this. Here we have a line where light's on this side and dark is on this side. These cells aren't going to be very active and that can be generating a huge burst. These cells over here aren't. But cells that are right on that line, because part of it, part of it is in the dark and the rest of it is in the light, this cell will be active, this cell will be active, this cell will be active, and this cell will be active. And so we're able to detect that line of orientation through those overlapping fields. Now, if we had a vertical line, what would happen is that if it was right down here, this cell would be active, this cell would be active, this cell would be active, but these other adjacent cells would not be active. So with the center surround organization, you're able to detect lines of any orientation. Now imagine if we had, for example, instead of the center surround, we only had this half of the cell is uh, on, this half of the cell is off. And that's the way they were all set up. In that circumstance, you would only be able to detect vertical lines. Or maybe the top portion of the cell is on and the bottom portion of the cell is off. In that situation, you would only be able to detect horizontal lines. So the center surround organization is essential for being able to detect lines of any orientation. Uh, so that's a really important aspect to, to consider here, these uh, uh, part of the receptive field. And just to kind of go back and talk about this here again, if the light is in the center, they turn on. Uh, if the light is in the periphery, they turn off. And if you, with all these overlapping fields, if you have a line like they were showing in that video, uh, what would happen is these cells wouldn't become very active, these cells wouldn't become very active, but the ones right on the line where the center is right in the light area will become most active. And you can see that it's detecting the line. Now, these retina ganglion cells send their information to the stray cortex. So what are the firing characteristics of cells in the striate cortex. And what we find is that there's one type of cell there that have responsiveness to lines of the specific orientation. So what we're going to do is build up from what we saw with those retina ganglion cells having their center surround organization, recognizing that they're sending axons into the striate cortex. And we see cells in the striate cortex are responsive to lines of a specific orientation. So here is um, all of these latter geniculate cells are sending their axons and they have synapses with this neuron in the striate cortex here in the occipital lobe. And they, when a line passes through them in this arrangement, what happens is this retina ganglion cell um, or that center on cell has a excitatory synapse on this neuron, this V1 neuron. Um, or a simple cell, and we'll see uh, their function here in a little bit. This one has an excitatory, this one. So if a line activates all of those cells, but because it's not activating anything adjacent here, um, we're going to get a bunch of EPSPs, or excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And that will cause a very strong response uh, to that stimulus. And we'll see a lot of action potentials being generated. Now what happens if we tilt that a line a little bit off. So now we're going to start to activate some of these other cells. When we do that, we start to activate these other cells. What happens is now they, instead of having excitatory synapses, they actually have inhibitory synapses. And so we have 
EPSP is generated here, IPSP is generated here, and because of that spatial summation, we get a weak response. So we see that there's a weaker response in this um, simple cell. And so these cells in the striate cortex are really sensitive to a line of a single orientation. Now I want to take you over to um, over uh, to YouTube again, and remember this is a link that's in Blackboard, and show you that cell and what it looks like. So here's a simple cortical cell that they recorded from the strike cortex, and what we'll see is that they're most responsive to just a line of a single orientation, and so those little pops that you hear are action potentials that are being generated. That burst is right in that receptive field of that cell that they're recording from the strike cortex. And so they marked that. They put X's right there on the paper to indicate that that is the uh, line of that orientation of that cell. Now, when they're in the periphery, we see that the cell is turned off. So over here at the edge, that turns off that cell. So they're marking the inhibitory area there. So when the light is in that area, they turn off. As we see over here, if you activate a slightly different area, you're going to turn off where those activations will actually cause IPSPs. Now what they're going to do next will be interesting to show what happens if you change the orientation. It doesn't respond to that line. Now as it gets closer, it starts to respond more, and then as it starts to be, so we can hear clearly clearly there, we can hear it's tuned, where its firing characteristics are based on a line of a certain orientation. So this provides some of the basics of form, building up from these center surround, and then uh, from those we can get lines. From lines we can start to put them together to make shapes. And so this is the basis of form perception or object recognition that starts in the LG. And well, it starts with the uh, tones and rods processing all that information about form getting back into the LGN with those on-center cells, and then those on-center cells uh, project here to the primary visual cortex. Well, we also see that there's another type of cell in um, the primary visual cortex. And oh, another thing about simple cells here is that we can see some cells are sensitive to a line, a horizontal line, whereas others are sensitive to a or is a, a diagonal line. So as we move across more from medial to lateral in the primary visual cortex, there's a progressive change in the lines that those cells are sensitive to. So not only is there a map of our visual environment, but that in that portion of our visual environment, the fovea will have cells that are responsive just to a horizontal line, a uh, slightly diagonal line, and it continues to change as you move from more medial to lateral. So we'll have some cells that are only responsive to horizontal lines, some cells that are only responsive to diagonal lines. And if you present a stimulus that's across those fields, that will turn that off. And then we see this kind of baseline level responding occurring. Now, in addition to those simple cells, we see what are referred to as complex cells. And complex cells um, have a baseline rate of responding, and if you play or if you present a line, it will start to fire, but if the line is moving in a certain direction, uh, what happens is that causes a strong response. So as long as that line is moving, of a certain orientation is moving, we'll get a strong response. If it starts to be a line of a different orientation, we'll get a weaker response. So it is really 
taking some of the information from those simple cells about lines of a certain orientation and gathering that so that all those cells of that orientation are moving across a part of the visual field, taking all that information and summing it through time. And so you have that temporal summation, which is the essence of what distinguishes movement from static uh, um, uh, pictures or videos from a picture, is that a video occurs through time, whereas a picture is just one point in time. So let's see what these simple cell or these complex cells look like. So if we go here. So we see that they are really responsive to a line that is moving. And each one of those pops is an action potential. So they're kind of defining the zone or the receptive field for this complex cell. So they're getting right within that. So it's more responsive to movement in one direction, but you hear there's a little bit of firing in the other direction. Now, what we see is they start to change the orientation of movement. It's not firing as quickly to where it's 90 degrees. We don't hear any firing at all. So again, these retina ganglion cells, these on-center cells are sending information um, to the simple cells. The simple cells are sending information to the complex cells. And the complex cells are collecting from multiple simple cells that are relaying different parts of our visual field. And as a line is moving across, you're going to get action potentials activated in all those simple cells. And because we have that temporal summation, it occurs relatively quickly in time, we get that sensation of movement, or we get that, uh, that detection that, that object is moving. So that's some of the function in terms of form and motion. What about color? And we have uh, um, two aspects that we'll talk about, or two theories of how the visual system constructs color. And at one point, they were thought to be opposing views. Um, but subsequent work has shown that they actually just reflect different portions or different parts of um, uh, the visual experience, different steps in the visual processing rather than imposing theories. The first theory was the trichromatic theory. And it was based on the finding that you can really, by mixing different wavelengths, you can create any color in our visual experience. So the projectors that you see in classrooms, what they're doing is they're projecting different colors. And combining them, you can create any color that you want. And the idea is that you can do the same thing within the visual system, is that we could have blue cones, green cones, and red cones. And because of the level of activity with a certain wavelength, we're going to have different um, perceptions or sensations of that color. So if a wavelength is in that 419 range, that will cause the highest amount of responding in our blue cones, but our green and red cones won't be very responsive. Now, if we have uh, a color that's in that green area, which is around <coughs> uh, 531, our blue cones will be turned off, but our green cones would be active, and then our red cones would be less active. We'll have a very similar pattern if we get into the red range, where our red cones will be um, 
active, but our green cones will be less active, and of course our blue cones won't be active. So from this basis, you could imagine that all we have to do is look at the relative firing rates of blue, green, and red cones, and that's going to signal a certain color from the electromagnetic spectrum. And while that provides part of the story, and we'll see that's an important part of the story, it's not the complete story. And I have a, a little optical illusion here that illustrates that. Um, uh, that while this makes sense of how maybe we can see these different colors, we see that there are strong um, there there are strong uh, uh, data, phenomenological experiences that suggest this is a complete story. And so look at the center portion, this crosshair here uh, that I'm presenting, and I have a link and drop uh, in a Blackboard to a YouTube video of this. Again, the video does have some bizarre music associated with it, so um, sorry about that. Um, but what you can do is, once you get that going, focus in on this black uh, crosshair in the middle and watch what happens in the periphery. So if you're focusing there, you'll notice the pink dots start to disappear and they are replaced by a flashing green dot that's moving around. Now shift your attention to following that, um, following that flashing dot or that dot that's missing around, and you see that there's no green that's being replaced. Now if you go back to staring at the center, now you see the green dot starting to appear at the periphery. Um, now flash back and follow the flashing dot, you see it's not there. What's going on here? Why do we see these after images? So if you stare at this long enough, you can see the, the green dot replacing the pink dots. Why is this, this happening? What is, what is occurring here in this, um, in this illusion? And just from what we saw from the trichromatic theory, it can't account for this phenomenological experience of seeing these after images that are being left there. So what has been advanced is the opponent process theory that, yes, we have red, green, and blue cones, but they synapse on ganglion cells that when excited, they stimulate one color, and when inhibited, they stimulate another color. So excitation and inhibition, EPSBs and IPSBs, excitatory postsynaptic potentials, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, will uh, elicit uh, sensation of different colors. And so what we have to do is then go through our basic colors and describe how this is activated. So if you present, let's talk about red, for example, you present a wavelength from the red portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that will excite our red cones. Excitation of our red cone will cause excitation of our red-green ganglion cell. And if a red-green ganglion cell is excited, it will signal red. All right, that seems straightforward enough. Excitation of our green cones will cause inhibition of our red-green ganglion cell. And if a red-green ganglion cell is inhibited, it signals green. So given this, excitation of the red cone excites red-green, and excitation of the green cone uh, inhibits red-green ganglion cell. Let's go back and look at that optical illusion. So what's going on here is that as you stare in the center, what's happening is that the red is being removed, and because you've excited red for so long, it starts to then, when the stimulus is removed, it becomes inhibited. And that inhibition is causing that green to be seen when that red or that pink is being removed. So as you focus here in the center, what's happening is the red is exciting, but then when that red's removed, that cell, those cells representing that part of the visual field now are inhibited because it's been excited for such a, uh, a time when it's removed, it becomes inhibited and it signals green. So we're able to explain this optical illusion by the function of both the trichromatic theory um, that we have these three different cones <coughs> and the opponent process theory recognizing that excitation of the red-green ganglion cells signals um, 
red inhibition of the red-green ganglion cells signals green. So if we inhibit that. Now, how do we see, so again, green inhibits the red-green ganglion cell. Uh, so excitation of the green cones inhibits red-green ganglion cells. How do we see yellow? We don't have a yellow cone. And what happens, we find with yellow, which is the special one, is that yellow excites both the red cone and the green cone. So both the red cone and the green cone are excited. And that combined excitation and inhibition cancels each other out. So there isn't any net increase or decrease in the red green ganglion cell. So that doesn't really uh, signal red or green. But because both the red cone and the green cone send excitatory synapses on the yellow-blue ganglion cell, that summed combined input now is able to excite those um, yellow-blue ganglion cells, and that signals that signals yellow. So red cones and green cones are both excited by the wavelength yellow, and that will cancel out any firing at the red-green ganglion cell and then cause both excitation here of the yellow-blue ganglion cell. So this also, I think, gives you a little insight to the fact that we can have uh, one cone or a group of cones that send both inhibitory and excitatory inputs to different targets. Um, and once they're both activated, this red um, green cone can inhibit and can excite at the same time different targets. So there's a lot of complexity in terms of neural processing going on here just within this early level of visual processing that allows us to see information in this uh, yellow part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, blue cones are uh, uh, activated by blue, and once they're activated, they inhibit these yellow-blue ganglion cells here. Um, so there's that, that process that goes on there. And that's how we can see that we start from the very basics of building up this visual information uh, from the cones and then these ganglion cells, and they'll send this information into the cortex. So next we want to talk about several different types of pathology, really to illustrate, uh, illustrate or or reinforce some of the processing that we've talked about. First, and structure. Um, first, uh, um, well, one condition that we can see is bitemporal hemianopia or tunnel vision. What happens is normally we have our visual system uh, processing information from our complete visual field. And information, remember, about the periphery comes from that nasal portion of the eye. And that portion of the eye is the only portion that crosses at the optic chiasm. Well, what happens is you can have damage there at the optic chiasm, <clears throat> and you'll lose that peripheral field of view, resulting in bitemporal hemianopia. Now, because of the optic chiasm's location close to the hypothalamus, and you can frequently see tumors developing in the hypothalamus, those tumors compress on the optic chiasm, preventing that communication of information there. And these are sometimes di discovered, this, this tumor is discovered when you go to the driver's license bureau, <clears throat> you go in and you have to look in that that uh, viewfinder where they, there's a light flashing on one side and the other side in your peripheral field of view. If you don't see those, that may indicate that there's a problem occurring here at the optic chiasm resulting in this tunnel vision or not being able to see the complete visual field. And it reflects that everything from that nasal portion of the retina crosses over. And if that's prevented, you only get that central portion of the field of view that's being processed by that temporal portion of the uh, of the retina. Now we have three different types of object agnosias that we'll talk about. The first is apperceptive agnosia, and it's an inability to recognize objects, an inability to copy objects, and an inability to um, match objects. With spared visual acuity, so they still have intact visual acuity uh, um, in terms of being able to recognize, uh, be able to see uh, information, uh, get information in. 
It's just they cannot recognize objects. They have intact color vision, so they can report the color, and they can report motion. So those are the most basic visual functions we kind of left with in our um, uh, um, straight cortex and uh, whatnot is still intact. It's just that higher level cortical processing uh, really in that ventral stream is disrupted. So this is a picture of some objects that they gave to someone with apperceptive agnosia and they asked the person to try to copy these objects. They asked the person to try to say what is this object and they can't say it. Uh, they can describe it but they can't say what the object is. Um, so it's, it's, it's a problem with being able to recognize this object. And so they can't copy it, they can't recognize it, and they can't match it. So if they had four, or they had these pictures over here, and they said which one of them matches that, they would not be able to do that. And again, this results in damage to that ventral stream. Very early on in the ventral stream results in this apperceptive agnosia. Now, later on, uh, or we can see a uh, less severe form of object agnosia is associative agnosia. And here is where uh, a patient now is able to copy. So they're able to copy this image. So this is the drawing. And we can see that they can copy that. But when asked what is this, they cannot say that. And so that still is a less severe form of um, um, object agnosia, associative agnosia, um, but um, they can match, they can copy, uh, but they cannot recognize. So uh, these are the uh, three models. These are what the patient was able to draw or copy from and asking the patient what is this object. They aren't able to put it all together. So they're able to copy it, they just can't bring it together and say what that object is. Again, this is damage further down in that uh, ventral stream. And our our most uh, selective form of object agnosia is prosopagnosia, or the inability to recognize faces. And so these people will be able to describe faces, um, but they will not be able to recognize them, and they can't even recognize their own face. They cannot match faces either. So if there's a person sitting next to them and they see a picture, they can't recognize them. And they can't recognize uh, their, uh, their own face in the mirror. They don't understand that. They can describe it. They can see individual components. These people will frequently compensate uh, by trying to look at certain features of a person, such as their voice or the way they walk, or even maybe trying to use their hair as a feature of how they um, uh, to recognize people because they can't pull all these features together into one. And it's a very uh, uh, difficult, uh, I think, to disorder to deal with because you can't recognize people, you know, which we take for granted. Being able to see a face of somebody that maybe only saw a couple times, being able to know that that person is familiar or not. Uh, so this is uh, one of those uh, very selective but uh, impactful kinds of object agnosias that we can see. Now, I have included a video in, uh, in uh, Blackboard under the content section that describes a specific case of prosopagnosia. And um, I encourage you to watch it, look through it, uh, and see uh, how uh, this disorder is uh, impactful on this person's life. So again, you can watch that video. I won't play it here because I don't think it does a good job of capturing it, but I think you can get a lot out of it. So uh, that is our last uh, uh, piece of information for the visual system. Again, uh, please go through, review the slides, uh, then try to take on the practice exams and then uh, try to uh, go after the lecture quiz so that you have a good understanding of this material. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. Bye.